Hello, you're watching BBC News. I'm Rich Preston. Our top stories. More than 40 countries pledged to end the use of coal, but major producers, including the US, India and China, are not signed up to the agreement. In Ethiopia, Tigrayan forces threaten to march on the capital, prompting the Prime Minister to tell residents to prepare to bear arms. The World Health Organization warns that Europe is once again at the epicenter of the COVID pandemic. And the UK becomes the first country in the world to approve an antiviral pill against coronavirus. Hello, welcome to the programme. The end of coal is in sight. That's the word from the government here in the UK, where world powers have been meeting at the COP26 climate conference. It comes after more than 40 countries promised to phase out coal in the coming decades. Poland, Vietnam and Chile are among the fast-growing economies which now say they'll reduce their coal use. But as our science correspondent Rebecca Morell reports, other big users of coal, such as China and the US, have not signed up to the deal. A dinosaur on the loose at the United Nations, but with a message for humanity. Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. Going extinct is a bad thing. If we want to save our planet and ourselves, we'll need to stop climate change. But to do that, fossil fuels will have to become a thing of the past. Today at the climate conference, the talk is all about energy. And top of the list is phasing out coal. This fossil fuel is the biggest single contributor to climate change and more than 40 countries have now committed to move away from it. I do believe that the end of coal is in sight. I do believe we're getting to a point where we consign coal power to history. The agreement includes coal-reliant countries like Poland and South Korea, but missing are the US, India and most significantly China, where half of the world's coal is burned. It has the biggest transition, the biggest challenges, uh, and needs to really drive a, a structural change in its energy system. Today's uh, precedence and, and uh, movement really increases the pressure for them to come up with those solutions sooner rather than later. Moving away from coal is the future aim, but what's happening to greenhouse gas emissions now? Since the 90s, carbon dioxide levels have been mainly rising. But during the pandemic, when the world shut down, they fell sharply. This year, though, they've increased rapidly again to almost the same amount. Behind those numbers is really a big rebound in coal in particular. And so probably what is happening here is that the stimulus packages to go out of COVID because they have uh, stimulated the current economy, which is a fossil fuel economy. But if we're to get to net zero emissions, what do we do about oil and gas? They've been filling some of the gaps behind coal, but some countries like Costa Rica and Denmark are setting a date to end their use and other nations at COP26 are expected to do the same. But the clock is ticking for decisions about our energy future. Scientists are clear, our reliance on fossil fuels needs to end fast. Rebecca Morell, BBC News, Glasgow. Well, we can discuss this now with Nikos Safos. He's Chair of Energy and Geopolitics at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies based in Washington, D.C. Mr. Safos, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, this is a big agreement, but America's not part of it. Does that undermine the deal somehow? What message does that send to the world? The message, I think, from the United States is, is quite clear, which is that the politics of phasing out coal are very tricky. They're very tricky here. They're very tricky in other parts of the world. And frankly, there is not yet a consensus in the country to set a date for phasing out coal. And that's what prevents the president and the delegation of the United States to be able to make that commitment. But it is also a challenge that every other country faces as well. So the United States is not alone, but its absence from this list of signatories is noticeable. The list of signatories is long. It includes countries from the developed and the developing world. Were there any countries that you were surprised to see on that list? I was very pleasantly surprised to see Indonesia signing on to this uh, pledge with 
a caveat, uh, but still, uh, I was very surprised to see Vietnam, one of the fastest growing economies and coal users in Southeast Asia, sign on to this pledge. I was surprised to see uh, Ukraine and the Philippines and even Botswana. There are a lot of surprises on that list. Uh, it's still, when you tally it up, just over 10% of the world's coal consumption. So we're not quite there yet, but it is a good list that countries like those are willing to stand up and say, under the right conditions, I too can do this. How does the agreement work in practice? What are countries actually signing up to? They're not signing up to much. There's no specific actions that they have to take. What it is, above all, is a consensus around certain key pillars. One, that we have to scale up renewable energy if we want to phase out coal. Two, it sets some precise dates, the 2030s for advanced economies and the 2040s for emerging economies for phasing out coal. It sets up, crucially, number three, a commitment to stop building new coal, because that is one of the changes we can make today, putting aside the phasing out of the existing system. And number four, very importantly, it says, if we're going to phase out coal, we have to look after the workers and the communities where coal exists now, because otherwise we're not going to have a just transition. Okay, great. We'll leave it there. Nikos Safos in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate it. The leading activist Greta Thunberg has slammed progress being made in Glasgow, tweeting that COP26 has been named the most excluding COP ever. This is no longer a climate conference. She says this is a global North Greenwash Festival, a two-week celebration of business as usual and blah, 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 a phrase she often uses to illustrate what she calls politicians' willingness to talk but reluctance to act. Let's turn to coronavirus now and a warning from the World Health Organization that Europe is once again at the epicenter of the pandemic. The WHO says Europe could face another half a million deaths before the end of winter if the outbreak isn't brought under control. The continent has recorded a 55% rise in cases over the past four weeks, despite the availability of vaccines. Corny Bembridge has this report. Romania's hospitals are at breaking point as the country struggles to deal with a fourth wave of coronavirus infections. More than 3,000 Romanians have died with COVID-19 over the past week, most of them unvaccinated. The country has the second lowest vaccination rate in the European Union. Just over a third of the adult population has had two doses. The rate of vaccination has slowed across the continent in recent months. The World Health Organization says people have become complacent. European countries have the capacity, uh, they have the va uh, vaccine access, they have the money, they have the, the systems in place that they can react. Many other regions don't necessarily have those capacities in place. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a warning shot for the world to see what's happening in Europe despite the availability of, 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 of vaccination. Infections are up right across Europe. Germany had a record number of cases this week. In the Netherlands, hospitalisations were up by almost a third and Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia are recording some of their highest daily figures. If we stay on this trajectory, we could see another half a million COVID-19 deaths in Europe and Central Asia by the 1st of February next year. Several European countries are now bringing back some restrictions, including mandatory face coverings, limits on non-essential shops and encouraging people to work remotely. Courtney Pembridge, BBC News. Well, staying with COVID, the UK has become the first country in the world to approve an antiviral pill against coronavirus. In trials, the drug was shown to cut the chances of dying or being hospitalised in half. British authorities have bought enough supplies to treat nearly half a million people. Here's our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. A pill that can stop COVID in its tracks. It's been the goal of scientists since the pandemic began. Now there is molnupiravir, and it's likely to be the first of many antiviral treatments. Anne-Marie tested positive for coronavirus on Tuesday and has just started a five-day course of molnupiravir as part of a trial in Liverpool. She's had cancer 
and so is more vulnerable to COVID. It's absolutely a life and death situation. I do have a family that I need to think about and I need to be here for them. And if this gives me the opportunity to be around for my son's wedding and, and everything else, then so be it. When coronavirus infects cells, it makes multiple copies of itself. Molnupiravir, originally designed to treat flu, introduces errors in the virus's genetic code, which hampers its ability to spread. It's probably formed faster now than for the first patients. It's over a year since the clinical research facility at Royal Liverpool University Hospital began testing molnupiravir on patients. Global trials have shown it halves the chances of dying or being hospitalised with COVID. To have a drug like this, to have an antiviral that's, uh, that's potent, that's able to be taken orally, uh, is a very important moment and does mark a milestone in our discovery of effective medicines against COVID. The UK has ordered 480,000 courses of molnupiravir, with the first doses expected to arrive here later this month. It's been approved for people with at least one risk factor for COVID, such as being over 60, obese, or having heart disease. It's most effective when given within five days of symptoms appearing. The cost of the drug hasn't been revealed, but in the US, it's 500 pounds per patient. The UK was the first country in the world to authorise the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines and now regulators here have again led the way by approving molnupiravir. It'll be months before doctors know how effective it is outside trials. But antivirals look set to play a key role in keeping Covid patients out of hospital. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. In East Africa, in Ethiopia, Tigrayan forces have warned they'll march on the country's capital, Addis Ababa, to prevent what they call a genocide being carried out by federal forces against the northern Tigrayan people. It comes on the one-year anniversary of the start of the war in the country. The Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, have taken two towns in recent days, prompting the country's prime minister to warn the capital's residents to take up arms. Samuel Getachu is a journalist in Addis Ababa and gave us this update. There has been lines of people uh, heading to uh, local government offices to register their weapons. Uh, they think that the government has told them that uh, they need to protect themselves if the TPLF comes to uh, Addis Ababa and attack them, abuse them. They're, they haven't come yet. Uh, but from what we've heard, the government is ready to defend the capital. The cap Addis Ababa is not just the capital of Addis Ababa, it's also the diplomatic capital city of the continent. It hosts the most diplomatic uh, embassies uh, in the continent. So it's an important city and uh, Ethiopia is I echo what was said by the State Department spokesperson in Washington, D.C. It's the mo one of the most important nations in, in Africa. And, uh, you know, it needs to be protected. It needs uh, the protection that it deserves. But how much that protection is going to be intact is an open debate. Samuel Getachew in Addis Ababa. Stay with us here on BBC News. Still to come, defending the Earth. NASA says it will test a new system that could deflect asteroids. The Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, the architect of the Middle East peace process, has been assassinated. A 27-year-old Jewish man has been arrested and an extremist Jewish organization has claimed responsibility for the killing. At polling booths throughout the country, they voted on a historic day for Australia. As the results came in, it was clear the monarchy would survive. Of the American hostages, there was no sign. They are being held somewhere inside the compound and student leaders have threatened that should the Americans attempt rescue, they will all die. This mission has surpassed all expectations. Voyager 1 is now the most distant man-made object anywhere in the universe and it just seems to keep on going. Tonight we prove once more that the true strength of our nation comes not from the might of our arms or the scale of our wealth, but from the enduring power of our ideals.
Hello, you're watching BBC News. Very good to have you with us. Our latest headline, more than 40 countries pledged to end the use of coal, but major producers, including the US, India and China, do not sign up to the agreement. Well, let's stay with that topic for now. Craig Hart is Executive Director of Pace University's Energy and Climate Centre and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Centre. He joins us live from New York now. Uh, Dr. Hart, very good to see you. Uh, what do you make of this deal? Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, it puts us on the right track, but um, it's only a start and it's it's clearly not enough. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of... Uh, first of all, this only covers the power sector, um, and as you've already indicated, there's a number of countries that need to be uh, really ceasing coal use in order to make this meaningful from the perspective of stopping climate change advancing. Uh, US, India, China not signed up to the agreement. Is there a hope that they might get on board in months and years to come? Well, in, in the US, uh, the U.S. has been closing coal plants simply because they're uneconomic and probably won't be permitting any new plants. And uh, one of the provisions is um, to uh, cease permitting new what they call unabated coal. Um, so in the U.S. case, you know, it's it's more about domestic politics not being able to sign on. But that's been happening. And by the 2030 period, we will have closed in the U.S. about two thirds of our plants. Um, China and India uh, are, are are a much greater concern in terms of new growth because they are, um, you know, rapidly expanding uh, their power sector still, and coal remains a big part of it. Uh, in China's case, they, you know, at least fifty percent of their power sector is still coal-based, and even and even though they've said they won't be financing new plants overseas, the ones that are in the pipeline will probably be built and they're still committed to coal as a reserve fuel um, and plan to build uh, coal plants at least in, through the next 10 years. So with China, it's a concern, India, it's a concern, um, but also uh, Australia is not uh, part of this. And, and the fact that the US is not part of this is actually more relevant from the perspective of they, you know, we, we, could, we produce coal and export it. And so the US and Australia um, will still be in the coal game as a, as a producer of the, of, the, uh, of the fuel. As part of this agreement, wealthy countries promise to phase out fuel in the 2030s. Developing countries get an extra decade to play with. They do it in the 2040s. Are those timescales realistic, do you think? Uh, much depends on the effort that's put in, particularly the um, the transition support for workers and communities and sectors. That's going to be crucial to making this work. A lot of this does come down to jobs and keeping communities that are dependent upon coal and other fossil fuels, keeping those communities, uh, you know, vibrant uh, even in a in an energy transition so um, you know a lot of this depends on the effort put in it, it is a it is a track it's a way to you know move things along but much of it depends on what we do with this track okay we'll leave it there dr craig hart from the pace university energy and climate center thank you very much for making the time for us thank you well, here in the UK, the government's facing fresh claims of corruption and sleaze after lobbying its MPs to vote in favour of a parliamentary rule change that would have opened the door for one of its members to appeal a suspension. Owen Patterson was accused of an egregious breach of parliamentary rules by lobbying for companies who paid him salaries of thousands of pounds a month. But after an intense backlash, Owen Patterson has now resigned raising further questions over Prime Minister Boris Johnson's handling of wrong wrongdoing by his own party members. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has this report. Take a step. Oh, Can you take a step back? Yeah, a different kind of protest. We're just going to check for time. A different kind of attack to green activists busy in Westminster today. Come down here. Sorry. Sleaze is the accusation against the government. Corruption, the claim. A former minister has now quit as an MP after he was found to have lobbied the government more than a dozen times for companies who paid him thousands of pounds. Standing down, Owen Patterson said, my integrity has been repeatedly and publicly questioned. I maintain that I'm totally innocent. My children have asked me to leave politics altogether for my sake as well as theirs. I agree with them.
I will remain a public servant, but outside the cruel world of politics. The eyes to the right, 250. But Downing Street had tried to save him. 232. Tories last night voted to tear up the rules he broke. But listen to the atmosphere in there. Order. What have you done to this place? Oh, Dozens of Conservatives outraged, the, stayed away. It would be terrible. But number 10 had backed the attempt to overhaul the system that monitors behaviour that would have saved him. The immediate backlash was bruising, nearly all of the front pages damning, the internet alive with claims of sleaze, political rivals immediately sharpening attacks. Many Tories too were appalled. Leave us that, actually. Thanks. So by mid-morning, ministers were back in the Commons, ditching the idea, and in effect, ditching Owen Paterson too. Last night's vote has created a certain amount of controversy. It is important that standards in this House are done on a cross-party basis. While there is a very strong feeling on both sides of the House that there is a need for an appeals process, there is equally a strong feeling that this should not be based on a single case or applied retrospectively. In other words, changing the rules that Mr Patterson broke is off for now. So what's your reaction to what's happening? But the opposition says it's a wider pattern. Corrupt. I mean, there's no other word for it, I'm afraid. And often in a situation like this, you have a prime minister who is trying to lead on public standards. What you've got with this prime minister is a prime minister who is, is leading his troops through the sewer. And so it is a complete mess of their own making. It's a very strong accusation to say this is corrupt. Well, it is corrupt because uh, there was a clear finding after due process. The attempt to protect Owen Patterson has backfired spectacularly so. It stirred questions again about the Prime Minister's attitude to obeying the rules, doubts about Downing Street's political judgment, and it's done the reputation of this place no favours at all. Boris Johnson says he's sorry to see Mr Patterson go, but outrage at how the Prime Minister tried to use Parliament will take time to fade. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Let's take a look at some of the day's other stories now. Portugal's president has announced plans to dissolve parliament and call a snap election in January. Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa made a televised address after Portugal's National Assembly rejected the government's draft budget for next year. The first time that's happened in more than 40 years. Tourists in the Mexican resort of Cancun had to run for cover after a shootout between rival gangs. It happened in a beach area near a popular large hotel, causing panic among guests. Local authorities say two suspected drug dealers have been killed. And New York mayor-elect Eric Adams says he would take his first three paychecks in Bitcoin and signalled his intention to make the city the centre of the cryptocurrency industry after he takes office in January. The Miami mayor, Francis Suarez, has also tweeted that he would take his first paycheck in the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. We're going to survive. Uh, the US space agency NASA has unveiled a system it hopes it might use to protect the Earth from asteroids. In what's being described as the first planetary defence test mission, a satellite will be launched into space and crashed into a pair of asteroids to try and change their course. The BBC's Tim Orman has the story. Space is vast and full of wonder. Countless stars, countless planets, and countless lumps of rock streaking through the cosmos. Earth has always been a potential target, exposed and vulnerable, until now. This is a computer simulation of DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which could be our first line of defence if one of those lumps of rock comes heading our way. Uh, nature has given us a uh, setup where we have an, uh, an asteroid, a binary asteroid that's approaching close to Earth uh, so that we can observe from Earth based uh, observatories. Uh, but this is a test. And this is how the test will work. Astronomers have long been aware of a pair of asteroids called Didymos and Dimorphos. Sometime late next year, DART will target them, smash into them, trying to alter their course. These asteroids are no danger to us, but others might well be. 
If there was an asteroid that was a threat to the Earth, what you'd want to do this technique with would be many years in advance, decades in advance, such that you would just give this asteroid a small nudge, which would add up to a big change in its future position, and then the asteroid and the Earth wouldn't be on a collision course. Of course, Earth hasn't always been so lucky. Around 65 million years ago, a large asteroid crashed into our planet, killing off the dinosaurs. It's happened before, it could happen again. But DART may come to the rescue. Tim Allman, BBC News. And before we go, a reminder, our top story this hour, more than 40 countries have signed up to a pledge to end the use of coal. But India, China and India have not signed up to the agreement. That happened at the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow. And you can find comprehensive coverage and analysis of the conference online, including this assessment by our reality check team of the impact of climate change. That's at bbc.com slash news. Thanks for being with us. Bye bye.